Hey, it's Tim here. In this video, we get to do one of my favorite things, breaking down keynotes. This time it's the Dreamforce Tableau keynote. I'm going to be breaking it down. And this one's a bit different because I actually ended up being part of this keynote. Stick around to the end of the video to find out more. Let's get stuck in. Okay, so you can go ahead and grab the video for the keynote. You can go ahead and watch it even at this URL. I'll put it up on screen and I'll put it in the description as well. It's on Salesforce Plus. Just sign up, uh, get an account. It's entirely free. I use my Trailblazer account to do this. And you can go ahead and watch this on demand. It kind of gives you a summary of the keynote, but uh, I think it's really nice that these are available. I wish more of the conference itself was available on Salesforce Plus more generally, but uh, we can talk about that some other day. Um, the context here is that Tableau's keynote is not obviously the main keynote. The Dreamforce keynote is the main keynote, but then each of the products have their own sort of uh, time in the, the limelight, as it were. And so Tableau's keynote is especially focused on just Tableau. The other piece of context for this is to bear in mind where it is. It's at Dreamforce. So this is going to be Salesforce centric. A lot of the features here should lean on the Salesforce platform. And a lot of the things they demo and show will naturally uh, sort of show how Tableau sits in the Salesforce ecosystem. So if you're not a heavily uh, sort of utilized Salesforce organization or you don't use uh, Salesforce with Tableau that much, some of this might sort of just feel a bit foreign to you, but I think it's still worth paying attention to because as Tableau evolves, clearly a lot of its innovation is going to lean on the Salesforce platform and there will be some benefits that I think will start to sort of play out. Some of that got covered in this keynote. But anyway, that's enough pre-talk, that's enough sort of preamble. We're gonna go ahead and watch this. I'm gonna go into full screen and we're gonna just get started. And uh, the point of this video, by the way, is to do a minute by minute breakdown. So I'll watch the whole thing, I talk through it. If that's not your kind of thing, I will do a shorter, much briefer 10 minute roundup of this. It just tells you what happened. But um, I like to analyze what's going on behind the scenes and some of the messaging. So that's what it will be in this video and that's what you should expect. As ever, it's all timestamped below. So let's hop in. All right, hello. Welcome everyone. And come on in if you're still coming in in the back. I think we have roughly 2,000 people in the room here. It is gonna be an amazing day. I promise you that. And it's gonna be an amazing conference for you. Hopefully you had a chance to see the keynote right before this. I also thank you for coming over here because I know it's probably a bit busy to cross the street and go across, uh, what street is that, 4th Street? And so thank you for getting here. Um, it's going to be a great day. But what I like to do next, uh, and I realize I don't have my clicker, so that's a great <laughs> move, is to thank you. And I want to say that it is very important to us, not just to thank you for being here and for spending time with us, but to thank you for being with us on this journey. At Tableau, we've been very focused, and we'll talk about a lot of that today on customer success and innovation. And you are all part of that. If you are a customer or a partner uh, or a community member, I know we have our community members here. I've seen a few of them in the front, which is awesome. Let's give them a round of applause. Mm -hmm. And of course, our, our amazing employees who've put so much work into getting to this point as well. So thank you, and we will move on. I want to talk a little bit about as well what we've been doing over the last 12 months, really since we got here. So two things. Um, when Tableau talk about uh, 12 months or the context for this, um, they're ultimately talking about the last Dreamforce. So that's what they mean by 12 months, not conference. And then secondly, it's a common theme, actually, at least for the last three years, is this sort of constant reminder. We see this slide every single year. And it's kind of an interesting one because it's almost a bit of a self-accountability spot. There's obviously a lot here that sort of reminds you of Tableau's heritage. If you didn't know, Tableau's 20 years old. That's sort of what this says, 2003 all the way to 2023. And um, interestingly, on the uh, on the Salesforce now Tableau website now, there is a little bit of uh, context that shows you the pre-Salesforce, post-Salesforce sort of world. That's really 2021 onwards. And you can kind of see, well, at least their interpolation of this, they're showing sort of all the milestone uh, points. And some of those are features, some of those are milestones, some of those are um, just, you know, hard numbers that should relate to the Tableau product in itself. So it's always nice to see this. And then I like this sort of touch point. Since 2022, um, it's an interesting one because 2022 was, was, was basically December. So what they're really saying in the last year, um, 160 uh, plus features. Now, the breakdown of these features is actually what matters. The detail behind this is actually super important. I've done this at a user group before, and we've actually highlighted that some of these have just been 
um, enhancements. Some of these have just been, um, you know, quality of life improvements, and some of them have been net new features. So uh, again, at some point, I, keep, I just keep reeling off videos I'll do at some point in the future. I just need more help. Uh, 160 features. I'd love to sort of break that down into the different uh, groups and say, look, these were new features. These were enhancements. These were changes and actually show that story a little bit more. There is a great viz that Jock McKinley has made that actually shows every single feature released in Tableau. And he himself has like a, a standardization, so they call it uh, oil, water, and some other sort of categorization. And I think it's really, really good. I'll put a link to it in the description as well. Um, so you can check out uh, that link. It will say Jock McKinley Innovation Chart or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think this is interesting context. It's always interesting how Tableau talk about their own successes as well. They kind of have to be proud about them and uh, show them off. But at the same time, it's what's not on there. That's also what's interesting. Um, you know, between now and 12 months ago, as I said, we've been very busy. We've been laser focused on delivering customer success and innovation. We've shipped over 160 new capabilities, things like uh, embedding playground, things like data cloud for Tableau, you heard a little bit about Pulse today in the main keynote. You're going to see more mm -hmm. today. Things like HIPAA compliance, important needs for our uh, healthcare and life sciences customers, and on and on. And all of these things you'll be able to see more of here at the conference and, of course, by speaking to some of our folks. So that's really exciting. Now, what's also exciting is to say that we just celebrated our 20th anniversary. It's <laughs> pretty... Pretty incredible achievement. And I, uh, if you, if I just pause there and think about it, like what products weren't didn't exist twenty years ago? The iPhone didn't exist twenty years ago, and um, Twitter didn't exist twenty years ago. No longer exists. Uh, <laughs> there's so many things that you will forget didn't exist twenty years ago, and Tableau's been around that whole time. Now, obviously, you know Tableau's not been this sort of blockbuster analytics tool for twenty years. It's probably been, uh, let's say, a main player for half of that, maybe even. A third of that, really, strictly speaking. Um, but it is now definitely an incumbent tool. It's very much got to that sort of same level of, um, you know, it, embeddedness or adoption as something like Power BI or back in the day it used to be MicroStrategy. It's now in that role of incumbent and it has to sort of think about its own future. And I think that's where this point is going. Tableau and Salesforce, we have spent the last 20 years really revolutionizing analytics and business intelligence. And we owe that all to you, everyone here in the room. Now, of course, we also became part of Salesforce roughly four years ago. And that has also been a journey that we are on. Lots of amazing things have happened since then. If you look in the keynote, some of the announcements that were made today with Data Cloud. And also, if you think about you know, one of the things we're seeing in this new AI revolution is really this pull, the pull to do more than just focus on the data professional, the IT or analyst, right? The person who's yeah. really doing all that hard work. Customers are telling us to do more, to go beyond. And so really that is sort of defining our next chapter. Our next chapter is really all about everyone, all of you and all of the people that you work with, because it's not just having data with your analysts. It's also having data and being able to be data-driven for everyone inside your company. And we'll talk about that. So again, uh, at the Tableau keynote, um, this pitch was more subtle. It was a little softer. Here, I think it's just flat out more blatant. What Tableau is essentially saying here is, look, for the last 20 years, we've been focused around the data analysts and enabling them. That's where our growth has come from. That's what has got us to where we are today. But that final mile, that final uh, you know, group of users in your business who aren't data analysts, the people who consume uh, data and information, for them, we need to push even harder. And so what Ryan literally says here is, look, our path has been uh, on data analysts, the next horizon, where we're heading, where we're going to the future, is going to be for everyone. So. In the previous keynote roundup, I literally said that, look, Tableau's future is going to be focused around everyone else, the consumers of data, rather than just being about data analysts, which means you have to understand that the, the feature and the focus, it's not happening yet. There's still a, a big push on sort of core capabilities around dashboarding and analytics, but with Tableau Pulse, with Tableau GPT, these are features geared towards 
uh, everyone in the organizations, allowing them to ask their own questions, allowing them to build their own insights, allowing them to curate the kind of metrics they want to curate without having to have an analyst as not necessarily a gatekeeper, but as a person to go through, right? How can analysts be empowered to empower everyone in the business to basically self-serve? That term, I hate it, but that is essentially potentially the direction that's going here. So this is, again, another framing of this. Tableau saying it in lots of different ways and lots of different languages just to make sure it's absolutely clear. And um, it's super important because, you know, he then goes on to say, look, you know, we do appreciate the work the community has done. We appreciate where we've got to. But this this point here just keeps coming again and again. It's also having data and being able to be data driven for everyone inside your company. And we'll talk about that today. Mm -hmm. And of course, this only, as I mentioned before, accelerates. This need becomes more urgent in the world of the AI revolution that we're going through. Now, this is all exciting, and I am very lucky to be up here as the CEO of Tableau talking to you about where we're going, because it's exciting, right? Who wouldn't want to do this? What's not as exciting is the amount of data that's coming at us. There's so much data coming at us every day, billions upon billions of gigabytes of data. And this data... That's like an interesting um, sort of tone change, isn't it? Like when uh, if you're like a musician or creative and you're trying to move the uh, listener or if you're making a film you're trying to move the audience through emotions um that's kind of what's just happened there it's sort of all this opportunity all this excitement around where tab is going but then there's a subtle shift in like the the tone and what's not so exciting is the overwhelming amount of data that's coming across and this this is a, i think he's teeing up a point here i mean i, I know he's teeing up a point i've watched the keynote <laughs> i was in it but he's teeing up a point here and it's essentially this um uh, sort of point that I think we're all aware of and we are not necessarily choosing to address head on, which is there is always a growing amount of data. I think if there's, if you look in, um, uh, uh, if you look on the internet, there's this, 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 this statistic about how much data is created every year versus previous years. And there have been a couple of inflection points where in one or two years, we created more data than the previous entire history of humankind, right? And that's all to do with the capabilities around storage, compute, things like mobile phones, devices, the things they do, the scale and quantity of uh, information they collect, but then also the opportunity that's available because a lot of data is being captured all the time, but it's not necessarily being stored. So um, in a sort of push to help businesses understand this, I think this is an important sort of piece of context. There's a world of opportunity in data but a lot of it sort of goes amiss. And that's because it's quite overwhelming. It's sort of, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it out there and it's hard to process and it's hard to do it well. I work as a consultant and that is literally my job, helping people uh, do better with how they uh, harness and turn this data into meaningful outcomes. Not just, you know, nice charts and beautiful visualizations, actual impact, actual bottom line uh, development, uh, you know, improvement and uh, quality of life for not just customers, but employees as well. You have to sort of wrangle all of this stuff. Data, it's collected, it's stored, it's processed, and it is consuming us. There's so much information that is out there. This data also continues to be, you know, in different places. And when I say that, I talk about this concept of it being disconnected. All of this data can be in a data warehouse. It could be on your phone. It could be on some type of local device, or maybe it's on-premise. It really could be anywhere. And that is concerning to me as the CEO of Tableau because we want to help you, of course, solve this problem. Now, I think it's also important to talk about, you know, Super interesting that Snowflake and Databricks are the two databases uh, mentioned here. I, I never think that's like a, a a slip of hand. I don't think the person who's making this deck just went and got the, just Google databases and Snowflake and Databricks came up first and they just grabbed two icons. I think it's a deliberate choice. Um, it might be to do with uh, Tableau aligning itself with the databases it thinks are best suited to its own platform, Tableau Cloud. Um, and, you know, these two platforms are kind of cloud native and Snowflake is. I don't know too much about Databricks, but I believe Databricks is also quite cloud native. And so um, it's a it's a subtle but um, important sort of detail to make sure you don't skip. Data is so important, as you know, we're here to talk about it. 
Uh, I'm wearing a shirt. The shirt says, like, I love data. I have shoes on it. I love data. A lot of us love data. And I keep asking the question of, like, why do we love data so much? Why are we so consumed by all of this data? And we're consumed by this data. Well, Tableau has always been about data. We are data people. And I'll say again, thank you to our community to helping us get there. We are data people, but... You could easily play like a, a data bingo. How many times can we hear the word to term data in this keynote? <laughs> if you know the answer to that, if you're willing to watch this entire video and tell me the exact number in the comments below, I would love to know and I'll think of some sort of suitable reward of some kind. <laughs> Let me know in the comments. Not everyone has been on this journey for 20 years. And so it's important to give you an example. I like to think of an example from my personal life and from our personal lives in general because right personal lives, well, they run on data too. Now, they run on data. How many of us have had an Apple Watch or glucose monitor, sleep ring? You know, maybe give me a show of hands that you've had some type of device that tracks your personal data. Well, that's Thank great you. because your data tells you what you're doing, what's going on. Is it going up or is it going down? It allows you to make decisions about your life. And really, in that case, your life, of course, whatever decisions you have, that ultimately determines your level of success. Now for me, I guess they convinced me to put uh, my Strava data up here. I am a runner, and I like to be out running around. That's why I'm taking all these steps, by the way, because I'm trying to get more activity. I am out doing these things because for me, I like to see what's happening. I collect data, everything from my steps to my elevation to my calories, and I look at this across many different apps, including Tableau, which that is Tableau up there. And this I just wanted to stop here and because this made me think of a point. I think a decade ago, I, I was into this craze. I was even part of this movement called Quantified Self. I did lots of talks about this exact thing, collecting data, scraping it, running it through. I have visits uh, about my music listening data. You'll hear more about that later. Um, this is how I got my sort of start in data. And it's actually understanding my own data that led me to realize why businesses themselves were passionate about their own data and how you could start to sort of make sense of it. It kind of taught me a lot about wrangling data because I knew a lot about myself, so I could immediately spot mistakes. What is super interesting that we live in a world today where what I was doing 10 years ago is just, just a standard feature of most devices now. So phones, watches, these all track step data. They just offer it to you, even without asking, right? Unless you, uh, if you buy an iPhone, as an example, and you go into Apple Health, you might know this, that even without an Apple Watch, it's tracking your step count. It's tracking a whole bunch of metrics. And it's only if you choose to do something with it, does it actually you know, start to share that out to uh, a place of choice. So I think it's a super interesting thing. And actually, I've thought about this many, many times. It's a really good way of contextualizing the challenge of data to everyday people because you know, steps, heart rate, these are personal metrics. These are personal health metrics. And I think health is a good way. It's a good analogy, actually, to make people understand the importance of doing something. And understanding these simple metrics kind of leads you down this path where you start to think about how you wrangle it, how you work with it. And it doesn't connect with everyone. Not everyone's super passionate about this data because they might not be an athlete. They might not be super, they might not have issues that they're tracking and therefore don't need to pay attention to these metrics in the first place. But everyone can relate to a simple metric like the number of steps, the distance you walk, uh, the quality of your sleep. These are things that we talk about day to day, right? That we can all connect with. And so... Uh, talking about the scale there and the scale in businesses and giving that as an analogy and using this to help um, essentially contextualize the challenge, I think is a really good mechanism. This is how I run my life, right? My goal is to run an ultra marathon. That's a goal for me. My version of success is actually to get there, but I have to tune all of the data and all of the data that is happening and being pulled inside of these various applications helps me to actually understand what I need to do and what I need to tune. So this is the personal experience, and that's great. But what about companies? Because I think companies also need to be data-driven. I'm sure you'd all agree. Yeah. See. Now, we believe at Tableau that data is the heartbeat of the modern organization. And that's exciting. What's not exciting, though, is that we've studied and interviewed and spoke to roughly 10,000 IT professionals, like people online, like people here in the room. And we found that actually less than 10% of them. So there's a little report here on the bottom left, Salesforce State of Data and Analytics Report. We'll have to have a look at that. 
but it's an interesting um you got to be careful with these surveys not saying that data is inaccurate or whatever but like um if this is a, if this is called the salesforce state of data and analytics report if salesforce queried people in the sector and the majority of them were salesforce customers it's more of a reflection on their customer base right it's not necessarily a reflection on the general industry but in the way that this is presented, obviously, no one's looking at that bottom left-hand side. So I think it's always useful just to go to that report and make sure that you look at it for yourself before, you know, really buying into these facts. And you understand the context of what that survey was trying to do, the questions asked. And um, you just make sure that you frame your understanding of these numbers with that context. I, I, I'm not saying these numbers aren't true and I'm not saying this context isn't true. I'm just saying make sure you frame that for yourself because those same numbers and those same uh, bits of information might mean something different to you if you understand the kind of people Salesforce were surveying and the responses those people gave. Are getting the full value of Oh, let's not go double speed. Data. <laughs> That's concerning to me. We could try it double speed. It's very <laughs> concerning. And it's really concerning in the world where we are being accelerated with AI, right? You must go faster. You must keep up. Now, some good news in that survey so yeah, ten less than ten percent of companies get full value um, from their data. Again, I haven't read the report, but I'm not surprised by the number. I know it's concerning, but I'm not surprised by the number because if, like, for for the for for the, let's say the ten percent who think they're getting the full value of the data, how do they know, right? Are they doing everything they possibly can with their data to gain in, in, to gain insight? I don't think the answer is yes to that, right? So. You know, if you ask the opposite question and um, you sort of break down, what does the question full value? Does full value mean that it's driving business aims and objective? It's literally helping you increase income, revenue, ROI. Um, or is full value just meaning that you are getting a useful insight that's helping you make decisions, but it doesn't mean your business necessarily is sort of turning a corner and doing better. So um, that term full value, I think, needs a bit of uh, contextualization. 87% of leaders, in contrast, though, say AI accelerates the data initiative. And that that is concerning for me, right? Like, this technology has basically been here for, like, half a minute. <laughs> and when I say half a minute, that's strictly not true. AI has been in the technology sphere for quite some time. But I think when you ask this question in 2023, immediately after we've had things like ChatGPT explode, and then leaders, leaders are seeing the opportunity that's available... How do they know it's accelerated the data initiatives? I don't think in the time that ChatGPT has been available that um, they could really claim that, right? I think it takes six months to really say, hey, this is what's possible. Unless what they mean is they're seeing projects that are now possible with AI. They're seeing opportunities that are now possible. And I think that's an important context here. Is it that uh, their data initiatives are being accelerated because there are small opportunities that are now more possible? Is it that AI is helping them crunch through data faster? Again, there's all this detail and context. Really good questions, I think, worth asking. Again, we've got to go to the report and find out. Um, but I think it's useful just to have that in mind um, when you sort of see these numbers. It's actually quite easy during the keynote to just look at these numbers and just buy into it because you're in the flow. You're seeing a keynote speaker talk and you're just buying into the what they're saying. You're trusting what they're saying. Of course, you trust the products. So you trust the, the uh, CEO saying these things. But me here, I'm sat after the keynote in my room with a nice camera, plenty of time to think. I've watched this three or four times. I get a little bit more sort of, not skeptical, but I start to interrogate the facts a bit more. And you can start to ask really good questions that might lead you to the actual answers that actually do validate these claims or actually make you think about them in your own context, which is super important. And that study, and it's actually called the State of Data and Analytics Report that you can all get your hands on, is that 87% of leaders said they are now, these IT professionals, accelerating their investment. They are now investing more aggressively in data management and their data priorities to fuel their AI strategy. And that's exciting. But, of course, nothing's that easy, right? Can't just solve it by buying tools because the journey is complex. It's not easy Correct. to go through this data revolution and AI revolution because some of us here maybe are analysts. Some of I love this, by the way. When I saw this, I was like, oh, yes, this is, I love this. I absolutely love this. And let me explain why. What you're seeing is essentially three ways of framing a business. You do it by roles, 
by the departments or by the industries they come from. And the reason I love this is that as a consultant, <laughs> this is basically what I do every time. I turn up to a client, I'm like, okay, who am I working with? They're the data analysts. Okay, which department do they work in? Accounting. And in which sectors do they work in? Education. Okay. And the combination of those three things literally configures my brain as to how I communicate with them. And for every single combination of role, department, and industry, there's a completely different way of handling the context, credentializing yourself, and working through problems, contextualizing problems, communicating with them. And it kind of presents a challenge to marketeers. Marketeers are constantly working in these sort of buckets and demographics, right? Um, but I've just never seen a company just boldly just flat out and say, hey, here are three ways of splitting our customer base and showing it to you as a way of sort of showcasing how they think about this problem. And essentially what I think Tableau is saying is this journey is complex. And depending on who you are and how you look at yourself, role, department, and industries, there's a different way of doing this. And I think if you were just take to take all the items on this list, you probably come up with a whole array of different groups and combinations. And the industries one is, I always think that's sort of the least important one, because let's say you are an analyst, you work in accounting in education, that's not going to be too dissimilar to a, let's say, a team leader in human resources who works for a bank, let's say, okay? And you might think, well, what do you mean? Well, the context of what you're doing doesn't necessarily sit under your role or your department. It sometimes sits in the nature of your business department and exactly the activities they're doing. And so um, it's you'll probably find some of these groupings sort of group up into the same buckets anyway, but I just really like the way this contextualizes um, everything. Now, little little subtle hints. I love, I love the details on these slides. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I love this little thing on the corner, data, CRM, trust, AI. AI is like very gently faded out. You could just pick it out. <laughs> and I always think like some designer sat there and thought about the different fades he was going to apply or she was going to apply to these rocks, right? And I just think that's fascinating. Data is the boldest one. AI is like faded out, CRM and trust. I don't know if these are sort of subconscious things that Tableau is sort of trying to pepper into the keynote, but I just, I just find those really interesting. Anyway, let's carry on. Us here, maybe executives. Some of us here, maybe individual contributors or operational folks. And so we want to be helping you in that regard. Now, you may be in different departments, HR, finance, so et cetera, or you may forth. be in different right. industries where there's regulatory compliance, um, data governance issues, data residency requirements. You may be in financial services. You may be in healthcare. It, it really is a complex world. And so. The most important thing that I can say, and I really mean this, is that we are your guide within the Salesforce and Tableau world. We are your guide. We are your trusted AI and data partner. And that's ex ex extremely important to communicate because we are going beyond. We are going beyond seeing and understanding your data because the journey, as I mentioned, is complicated. We will start by helping you connect and of course, harmonize your data mm -hmm. with, of course, Tableau data management and data prep, but also with amazing tools Mulesoft. like MuleSoft, and also with tools and solutions like the Salesforce Data Cloud, which connect to third-party applications and data warehouses, et cetera. Step one, if you will. And then going beyond that, we will continue to help you see and understand your data, whether you're using Tableau, whether you're using the Salesforce Intelligent app suite, like revenue intelligence, or of course, Right? Any allowed there to go to the next step, which is taking action with your data. In my personal example, I explained how I'm taking action with my data. Well, you need to take action to, to be successful. And to be successful, right, you can use some of these new exciting things like Tableau Pulse, which you'll hear about today, or Slack, or third-party applications. We want to help you across that whole journey. Now, what's, what's actually in my experience of roughly three and a half months in this role one of the most exciting things that I get to do is work with our amazing community. And these folks are here to also help you. This is our unique differentiator. Awesome group of people. Right? And yes, let's give them a round of applause again. Because our community is here to help you be successful. These are the individuals who've spent so much time. They are data people. They know how to make a data-driven culture work. They have made themselves successful. They have made their company successful, and they have made the world more aware of data. 
and this is incredible, and this is a really great tool and a very unique differentiator to Salesforce and Tableau. So I want to thank them again. And then the other thing I would say as we move forward here is we want to deep dive as we move into this next chapter, which is how do we go from our current environment of focusing on our beloved analyst, but also talk about, of course, the business user, maybe someone like myself, or the CRM sales, uh, Salesforce CRM user. And so that, I'm incredibly excited to bring up my really good friend and colleague who has nice shoes on, Francois Agenstadt. So I'm going to pause it right there. Uh, I'm also going to take a break. But um, business users, analysts, CRM users, this is contextualization of what they mean by everyone. See, analysts are right there at the core. But then, at least in the Salesforce context, CRM users are just the people who are out there using Salesforce. And then the business users are uh, people who sit in the business. You could almost see these two as basically the same thing, but they're just contextualizing it this way. And then uh, Francois is a chief customer officer. He recently changed from being a chief product officer, had been for quite some time the chief customer officer. And so he starts to go through uh, some features. Anyway, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to watch some Formula One, and then I'm going to come back and finish recording this video. See you soon. Okay, we're back. I watched Formula One. What an ending. Uh, for context, Signs won the race. If you don't know which race I'm talking about, he's won two races, so that should tell you which race. Okay, let's carry on with this particular keynote. All right. <laughs> no, I got my own. Thanks, Ryan. I got to say, your shoes, pretty stylish. Got good taste. Well, hello, everybody. It is so great to be here with all of you to talk about the latest innovations coming to Tableau and how you'll be able to bring data to even more people. Because this is the era of data. We know that companies that use data are just more successful companies than those that don't. And okay. we know that employees who are empowered with data are just more satisfied employees. They're able to get their jobs done better. Ooh, so the opportunity is truly to bring data to everyone and make every company a data-driven company and every person a data. So um, if you're ever watching these keynotes, a bit of behind the scenes, um, you can see there are two people by this log. Um, one of them is uh, uh, April. Um, I know her because she helps choreograph all these wonderful demos that we see here on stage. That is, uh, that is one of her roles uh, in Tableau. And then we I think we have a product manager, we're going to get an introduction. I think we have a product manager who's about to walk through the demos and you can see a whole bank of laptops uh, that are uh, set up, ready to go. I'm sure they're all backups of backups, but uh, yeah, that's basically what's about to happen. So if you're ever watching a keynote and you see two people get up to go to this log, know there's about to be a demo, which is probably what's going to come next. Person. And this is what we're going to talk about in this session. We're going to talk about how we're bringing data to everyone, empowering every single user. Whether you're a business user or an analyst or a CRM user, everybody should be able to use data to make better decisions faster. And this is key because our mission is to help people see and understand data. And that truly does mean all people. And you'll see in this keynote how we're going to be bringing new experiences for our users with new metrics and insights that makes data easy, approachable, and contextual. How we're going to make everyone be able to explore data in an easier way than ever before, and how we're going to deliver analytics in the flow of work so you have smart applications that are actionable. This is what this keynote is all about. And of course, we're going to sprinkle a lot of AI right oh, yeah. at the heart of the keynote, because the AI is an opportunity. So this is an interesting slide. I feel like this is um, there's some firm dates in here. So Tableau Pulse. Uh, general availability December 23, which means which means 23.4 will come in December 23, which also means the gap between 23.3 and 23.4 is going to be tiny. I wonder if they're just going to sneak it in right before the end of the year, right? Like just after Christmas, um, not before Christmas, because that that would that would essentially mean if 23.3 comes out, let's say at some point. Um, this month, let's say in the next three weeks, that's my guess. Um, actually, no, let's say 23.3 comes out the beginning of October, right at the beginning of October. Then you've got October, November, end of December would kind of work. And it doesn't have to be a big release. It'd be a quiet release for 23.4. 
but that is interesting. It's also the first time we get to see Tableau Pulse in public. I feel like what's happening right now is that Tableau Pulse is being rolled out sort of behind the scenes, but at 23.4 might be when we then get uh, Tableau Pulse going out. Einstein Copilot for Tableau. Now this feels like something new. I think this is an official name. Uh, at conference, we previously saw something called Tableau GPT, and that was a pretty interesting uh, set of capabilities. Um, it feels like Einstein Copilot is the sort of brand name that sits on top of that technology. So Tableau GPT is the underlying technology. The product that uses that is Einstein Copilot. Copilot is an interesting brand name because, of course, that's been made famous by Microsoft, specifically GitHub Copilot. And then Microsoft uh, deployed that more widely across its platform to then make Microsoft Copilot and Excel Copilot and all of these wonderful Copilots. Einstein Copilot feels like Salesforce's take across the whole entire platform, but specifically in Tableau, it's obviously going to help you do certain things. What is not clear is whether it's going to need you to have a Tableau Cloud or specific capabilities around Salesforce. I assume it will need something like Tableau Cloud for it to work because um, for, for, for you to be able to deploy that kind of model capability in your own Tableau server would be kind of tricky. Or if you do get to deploy it on your own Tableau server, they might ask you to open up specific uh, ports and specific uh, IP addresses to Copilot so it can process all the requests, uh, but then use some of that magic with your on-premise tech capabilities to start to understand what's going on. But there's no way Copilot is working without understanding what's going on on your infrastructure somewhere in the cloud. That's almost a dead certain thing. Um, if they are able to deploy that kind of thing onto server without that capability, then wow, that's 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 a huge sort of Apple-like approach to data and privacy, running all the modeling on your own servers. But again, as Apple does, you need incredible integration between hardware and software to be able to get the optimizations that make that sort of make sense. Anyway, intelligent apps, general availability now, be interested to see what that is. I don't know what that is. Um, I might be missing something, but uh, let's let's wait and see what that is. 33% faster time to insight. That is an interesting metric. There's no context for it. So let's hope we hope, hope we get that. And uh, there's some logo for some companies. So you've got source, financial year, FY24, Salesforce, customer success metrics. So I don't know if these customer success metrics, that 33% faster time to insight relates to these three companies uh sort of speaking to that number um so if it is 33 percent faster time to insight for these three companies that is what the star is and i think that's what that source is pointing to maybe there's somewhere at the end with an appendix who knows but <laughs> unnecessarily detailed amounts of tearing down this slide let's move on <laughs> there is no ai without data and this community is all about data so we are at the heart of the ai revolution Right. And That's true. by bringing AI into our... I'll stop it here. I think the NVIDIA CEO said this himself uh, when they announced their partnership with Snowflake, which I covered separately. Um, he said, for AI to work, you've got to bring the most capable AI platform to the world's best data platform, which at that time was Snowflake. And I think Tableau is right to contextualize that here. Tableau is a product that sits in the heart of data, naturally means that Tableau has to have a pivotal role in some sort of AI capabilities. What is interesting is that um, what that AI does is really the fundamental question. NVIDIA can generally just talk about its hardware that enables AI capabilities, that sort of bare metal uh, kind of innovation, whereas Tableau really have to come at it from a SaaS perspective, so software as a service is SaaS. So therefore, their innovation here has to be software-led. So they have to come up with products that sit on top of that kind of capability um, and see how that gets deployed. So let's wait and see products, it'll make the product experiences easier to use because we're going to make the complex simple. It's going to enable us to bring new experiences that broaden the reach of analytics for more people. And ultimately, it'll enable everyone to be successful with data. This is really the opportunity. And you're going to see it in the new Tableau Pulse. You're mm -hmm. going to see it in the new Einstein Copilot for Tableau. And you're going to see it across every single one of our applications. This is the beginning of the new generation of, the ta of Tableau and the new opportunity for everybody to become data powered. And just to call it out there again, Francois saying it himself, it's the beginning of the new generation for Tableau, right? They kind of, they bookended the chapter. And I think Salesforce 
acquire Tabler maybe at a good opportunity because I don't think the chapter was clear that it was going to be sort of bookended like that. Maybe it was and uh, we didn't know it and we didn't see it coming. Salesforce did. But nonetheless, um, at least for Tablet, it feels like they are realizing this AI revolution is going to fundamentally change the way they do their work. And in some way, I agree. Um, I agree for lots of reasons. I'll come to that later. Anyway, let's carry on. And of course, whenever we talk about data and AI, we have to talk about trust. It's important that the AI is trusted and ethical, that your data stays your data and is not used to train other applications, and that we're transparent about how we use your data and how AI is done. It's actually super important that you have this slide. I think uh, Tableau have to basically lead every discussion with AI about this. So number one, your data is not our product. You control access. Uh, we prioritize accurate, verifiable results. Now that is that is that is the boldest claim on this one. I'm not saying that it can't be done. I'm just saying that's easy to hold them to account to. You can literally just simply take the AI output and say, "Is this accurate? Go and test it and find out the answer." Um, the others are, you know, based on trust. You have to take Tableau's reputation, and they have to come up with white papers and evidence for that. That's quite easy for them to do, and I believe them because Tableau has a history of meeting tons of really difficult compli um, compliance standards. Um, our product policies protect human rights. Uh, that one is um, that's open to debate because as, 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 these, as these things go, policies are always open to interpretation and the policies change over time as well. So it's kind of like a moving goalpost. So you can say that now, but then something might change in the future. The standards might get lifted. The standards might get lower. And you can either choose to uphold higher standards or just keep the bare minimum or drop the standards. So there's always sort of three routes you can take in this in this uh, field. We advance responsible AI globally. That is also an interesting claim. Um, what does advancement mean? Is that sort of showing product leadership, product innovation, showing the right way to do something, uh, contributing to projects that support this kind of thinking? Uh, and then transparency builds trust. Uh, yes, actually being transparent about this path and you know how it's being built is super important of course it can't be fully transparent because this is a product and if they tell you how they're doing everything then <laughs> then the competitors can just go ahead and copy it and we work in a world and space where ultimately all these platforms are SaaS platforms which means they sit on top of things like aws and therefore the core underlying capability can be leveraged by other people uh, once you've seen how something is done, it's very easy for you to find several ways of achieving the same thing, even if you don't necessarily have the same front-end or back-end platform. So um, super interesting uh, breakdown there. And this is key, and it is core to the Einstein platform. All right. As I mentioned, the goal is to reach more people with data. I love it. I love this slide. Then dashboards and charts, gauges. You can't even build a gauge in Tableau easily, so I don't know why that's there. Nonetheless, now none of the dashboards, yeah, none of the charts. Here we're going to give you metrics. So this is super interesting, isn't it? Reaching more people with AI. This is what AI is going to let us do. Search and metrics. They're literally spelling it out. This is how you're going to be, uh, you know, the product is going to change. I think this could be the defining sort of direction of Tableau. The search box, the Omni search is going to become a core part of the product. And in a way, I've said this myself when I was playing around with ChatGPT. I said, if you can't fit everything in this box, then you might as well give up. And it kind of feels like Tableau semi-agrees with some of that, but also understands that its uh, core interface is also going to have to change to make it more accessible. And using AI, or AI along the way. Now, today, the way most people consume data is by getting dashboards. Everybody getting dashboards today? Do you want more dashboards? Not really. You want more <laughs> insights. You want more action. You want more. Just kill the life of uh, hundreds of analysts out there building dashboards, yeah? You're building dashboards. You, you feel like you're killing the dream. You're, you're, you feel like you're delivering. And uh, your end users are sat here at conference going, oh, I hate these things. I don't want any more of them. Love it. I love the fact that someone in the background shake, shook their head without even the prompt. Uh, he asked a question, they were immediately going like that. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. More empowerment. Now the opportunity is to simplify the experiences and make data as easy as a Google search. Make data as approachable as every single widget you have on your phone. Yeah. If your business data gets used, that creates opportunity. And we want everybody to use that data. 
And this is why today we're really excited to share with you our newest application, Tableau, Tableau Pulse. Pulse. Tableau Pulse is a whole new experience for data that's powered by generative AI. It's personalized for every single user, contextual to the task at hand, and it is smart. It enables you to pull out insights from your data automatically. I'm going to pause this here and just say, I've actually done a video breaking down the Tableau Pulse announcement from Tableau Conference. It goes into it in pretty much the same detail. If there's anything new in here, I will put it out now, but I think this is going to be the same demo as we saw back then. So let's have a look. So you guys want to see it? Yep. Yeah. All right. Homer, are you ready to show it? Absolutely. All right. Please welcome Homer, Homer Wang. Homer Wang. All right. Thank you, Francois, and hello, Dreamforce. I'm Homer, a product manager here building Tableau Pulse and Tableau AI for all of you. Now, I hope you're just as thrilled as I am. So this is an interesting um, starting point. Number one, we're in Slack. This is what this interface looks like. I'm actually a customer of Slack, and um, this looks like a new interface. It looks like an updated version of Slack that is, I think, trying to replicate Teams. I think they announced some sort of change that makes Slack look more like Teams for the companies that kind of, um, you know, really love Teams but don't want to let go of it and want something that looks like that in order to switch. So um, really nice. Obviously, I think it's quite a polished setup. So what we have here is a Tableau app inside of Slack, and it's obviously uh, the way Slack works with Tableau is... <laughs> My watch is coming out. The way uh, Slack works is that there's a Tableau app which creates a one-to-one -one chat with you as an app. So that's what you can see here on the left-hand side. And in essence, in there is where it delivers you personalized uh, messages and notifications. It doesn't yet um, feed those in entirely into the channels setup. I think it can post alerts into channels, but specifically these sorts of uh, insights come to you via the app to show you how we're reimagining the way anyone interacts with data. So, demo hats on, and let's dive right in. Like many of you, I start my day in Slack. With Pulse, I can get a personalized digest on the key metrics that I follow and matter mm -hmm. most to me. Now, AI looks at what's happening across the board and delivers a crisp summary up front so that I know what to focus on in just two seconds. And here, I see an unusual uptick. In so let's uh, let's just interrogate sort of what this is doing. So it's interesting because there's no um, visual element, but we do get this sort of uh, call out of this unit indicator that we saw earlier on. So device sales, 1,675 units. You get this prompt that says, is it helpful or not? Um, and at the very top, we got this Tableau Pulse Digest for September 12th, 2023. So. This is something new. A Pulse Digest suggests that it's going to be sending you a daily update, and it's a digest of the things you care about. So device sales, campaign ROI, and regional revenue seem like three separate metrics, hence they're bold. So device sales are seeing an unusual spike uh, since the beginning of this week, while quarterly regional revenue and monthly campaign ROI are steadily increasing. So these are three metrics, and it's basically telling you what's going on. Additionally, Seven of your 12 other metrics have changed, four favorably and three unfavorably. So that's a pretty nice summary. What is interesting is there's no visual element here. So it would be nice to be able to see those metrics like as a scorecard here, like just show me all 12, uh, show me the four favorable, the three unfavorable at the top, and then um, talk about the other seven, um, you know, just that are just doing nothing basically. <laughs> Um, so I think that would be kind of nice. And maybe this is where the product is heading, but, you know, immediately here, well, maybe that's what this actually, no, that is what this breakdown is below the, the line below it makes it feel like it's something separate, but actually it's one thing. So then we do get a breakdown again, nothing visual, which is a shame. You get a text breakdown. So device sales, uh, that's what we've got there. Regional revenue we've got there as well. And so let's see what else is in this. Let's keep carrying on device sales. Well, as a regional sales manager, this is great news. But I do need to understand a little more than that. So let's click in. And here on the metric cool. detail page, I so it clicked on Slack, and it took them straight to a page in Tableau Pulse. So I'm sure it won't be that smooth. It kind of animated in between the two. That's definitely something like a Figma interaction. But 
Uh, ultimately, you go to, to Tableau Pass. This Tableau Pass interface feels almost entirely new. It doesn't feel native to Tableau. Um, it's super interesting. There's a whole social element to this. There's a whole profile element to this. If this is the new interface coming to Tableau Cloud, that's going to be super interesting. But you do get this uh, lead in with this sort of visual element that I was talking about. So you can actually see the general trend, the kind of uh, general area that your data performs in, and you kind of see um, a breakdown at the top. If you've used something like Alteryx Auto Insights, this is very similar. But of course, uh, <laughs> where Tableau definitely has an upper hand here is that they've got the entire Tableau server and uh, charting capability to boot as well. So, um, you know, with something like uh, Alteryx Auto Insights, what, what you have to do is uh, essentially, you know, push the data into Auto Insights from the uh, output of an Alteryx uh, flow, or you can feed it specific data sources to look at. But even then, um, this just feels a little bit more sort of um, smoother. The experience feels smoother, even though it might actually be doing the same thing, but just not as advanced. Anyway, let's keep uh, let's keep having a look. You can clearly see this latest anomaly picked up by Tableau and visually explained to me. I can also explore metadata on the metric that our analyst friends help define mm -hmm. so that I can trust what I'm seeing. And if I want, I can... I think the fact that metadata is buried there is actually a bad thing, right? The device cells, no one clicks on that eye indicator. How often do you see indicators like that? You just blow right past them. If anything, um, if it's like any sort of social or digital feed, what you do is you look at the things that are calling out at you. So the the green uh, and the big numbers, that's where you go to. You, kind of, you know, if you tell me where do I find the information about uh, this data source, um, you'd look around a little bit and you'd spot that eye and then you'd click on it, but it's not natural. I kind of feel like it should just sit up there at the top. Device sales, published by, owned by, and the kind of general metrics, and then a sh uh, like show data metadata, like just call out that you are going to see the metadata for this data set rather than this very sort of clean interface, which feels like a UX win, but it's not a very useful. Like in business, you need context up front. You don't want to have to click in to see context. That makes it two activities that are unnecessary, one to click in, one to click out. Um, so yeah, nice in space, but I just think like just just put that metadata in it right up front. Tableau, Tableau Cloud, Tableau Server does that already. And um, with certified data sources, you can just go and see some of that metadata immediately. So um would love to see that here. Filter this view to my own liking while respecting my security context. Okay. Now that I know what I'm looking at, what about the why? Well, guided questions just by AI help me phrase what I want to ask, but don't necessarily know how. Mm -hmm. And here, I'm interested to know which products drove the sudden increase. Right. And with one click, I get a plain natural language insight accompanied by visualization, all coming from Tableau. There was a subtle um, sort of broken user interface there. Um, when, it, when you clicked, the activity happened below. So if if we just go back a few seconds, this is like ridiculously detailed um, product feedback, but hey, this is the keynote breakdown. We can do this here. So here you can see the window, the fold as it were. So everything in the window is as is, but then if you click which products drove this sudden increase, essentially the activity happens out of the fold, right? It kind of feels like the page should scroll so you see that. It's one of those sort of sort of, let's say, slightly difficult but annoying uh, things to achieve in web design where you're always keeping the user in context of what they're asking for. And um, when you click on that, I kind of feel like maybe the uh, thing should load the new inside of the top and the old thing should go at the bottom. Uh, it's sort of unintuitive or click on it, but then scroll the page down so the user sort of sees that story being told sort of vertically or goes to the right or goes to the left, go wherever you want, but just make it more obvious. If you see this interaction, uh, he clicks and then it goes over to uh, the bottom, but we have to then scroll down to see it. So watch this. What I want to ask, but don't necessarily know how. So here we go. And you, you, here, you I'm in. interested to know Probably doesn't which help. product drove the sudden increase. So and with he clicks, one click, I get a plain natural language insight accompanied by visualization, all coming from Tableau. Now, this insight here shows me the top drivers behind this change okay. ePhones and Simpson phones. Well, like Ryan said earlier, these smart devices, they're all the buzz these days. And of course, we all have our own questions too. 
Now, in this case, I'm wondering if we fulfill these orders. So I can simply start by typing in pulse where smart and contextual recommendations come up at every step with the help of AI. Okay, so let's just stop this for a second and make sure. Will we fulfill phone orders? Inventory fill rate, North American phone. What is projected inventory fill rate? Is there seasonality in inventory fill rate? Okay. So basically, the context here is you've seen you've seen an increase in certain sales. And then you're basically asking, hey, are we are we going to be able to meet these orders? And by asking the question, Tableau, let's call it Pulse, but it's actually GPT, um, has come up with three perspectives, let's say. Inventory fill rate, North America uh, phone. Inventory fill rate, North America tablet. And then pending orders, North America. So three ways that you could find out this answer um, based on metrics that exist. I have to assume that it's based on metrics that already exist. And um, yeah, let's 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 play this out to see what's going on. I like the social element telling you which one most people follow. Maybe it should be sorted that way, right? So most people are probably just going to go to advanced inventory fill rate, North America, tablet. But the context of tablet and phone is super interesting. Um, I wonder if there's an inventory fill rate North America view of which tablet and phone are actual filters. And so maybe there's some nesting and some hierarchy work that could work here to say that these are the same metric with different options. That could be a nice uh, little interaction. But anyway, let's let's play this through. And there you have it. You another metric, metric another insight. I'll answer my question. So that kind of does answer my question. Inventory fill rate is the metric. North America is a regional filter, category is a regional filter, and the month-to-month -month comparison is, again, contextual. Now, now, what is interesting is I think they've kept the month-to-month -month comparison um, consistent across these, but uh, you do get an indicator that says low. I, I assume you have like certain thresholds where you can set that when you build the metric uh, in here. You have an overview and then you have a breakdown view. We'll see what that is in a second. Um, you got this little light bulb. So inventory fill rate for first of that is now 91%. A drop below the expected range of 95 to 92. That doesn't mean it's bad. Um, a new unfavorable trend has been detected for inventory fill rate. It's trending down compared to the previous trend. You see, that's an interesting one. Like if you have a blockbuster sales event, then you will get an unfavorable inventory fill rate, right? And so that is maybe a, like a false positive, right? It is bad. But if it's off the back of a really successful sales period, let's say you sell out of a product, that's not a bad thing, um, it, especially if you <laughs> sold every one that you made and you can't make them fast enough. Um, that maybe leads to other questions around price and availability and resources and material, right? So that could be something that scales unfavorably, unfavorably with Tableau metrics, right? Lots of false positive where people are going in, it's saying something's unfavorable, but you go and look at it and you're like, well, that makes total sense. In fact, that happens all the time because I just ran a promotion and I expect my inventory fill rate to be super low because you build up stock to, you know, release them all at once. Easter eggs, uh, Christmas, uh, uh, Halloween. These are all events that will have incredibly low inventory fill rates right after they've happened you're not going to have a high fill rate for something like turkeys. So how does the system understand that context? How do you feed that content into the system, into these metrics to help you sort of understand that? So super interesting challenge for Tableau to figure out there. ...at the speed of thought. Now, what's happening behind the scenes is Pulse detects business critical insights, such as drivers, trend, forecasts, and outliers, mm -hmm. all with trusted statistical calculations from Tableau where AI can make the language more consumable and deliver them to you proactively so that all of us can see and understand data. So I actually agree with that framing of AI. I think it's a really good way of putting it. Um, AI is like an interface to the data. It allows you to ask a question and find the answer, and it's helping sort of synthesize what you want out of the data. Um, what is interesting is, <laughs> in the background, is AI doing the hard work or is it actually not just AI doing the hard work? Is there actually some other more complex thing going on? Are analysts setting up these metrics and building out these contexts like we've seen in the past with Ask Data? Who is doing that work? Who is setting the contextual landscape for this AI machine to go off and understand how things work? So that is super interesting. Now, we do have a new chart here. This one's amber, so let's try and figure out why. 
Now you ask, what is the projected inventory fill rate? Uh, so I think it's drawn this amber chart. Um, again, this was out of the fold, wasn't it? We landed on this page and it's only now that we've scrolled down, it might be because the demo screen is small and it's a laptop, but kind of, valid, sort of vilifies my point earlier on. <laughs> this this nice little chart was <laughs> out of the fold, so we didn't actually see it until you scroll down. But if this trend continues, inventory fill rate for phones is predicted to be 89%. Cool. Is that a good or bad? That's fine. That might be fine if you've just had a new iPhone, for example. Um, the new iPhone has just come out and you can't get any until November already, as is always the case, because you know, people just want new phones every year, apparently. But that's not a bad thing when you can't fill inventory that fast for a new product. That happens every single year. So who sets the context to say this is good or bad, right? <clears throat> Can you tell the system that only let me know if it's if it's below 10%, set a 10% threshold for inventory fill rate. If it falls below this, then we're going to have long-term supply issues and long-term demand issues and long-term fulfillment issues, right? Where is that sort of capability? Anyway, let's play on. But it doesn't stop there. What if I want to stay on top of these changes and share my findings? Okay. Well, in just two clicks here, my entire team now is following inventory fill rate so that they can start tracking and acting on it too. So if this is Tableau Pulse and this is going to sit inside a Tableau Cloud, that interface we just saw there is completely different to the sharing interface we see today. Side by side, they're just not the same. I'll try and put a screenshot of it up on screen. Um, yeah, they're just not the same. So there's a whole lot of, let's say, um, uh, staging here that if it's genuinely going to be available in uh, December, as we're seeing it like this, wow, there's a lot of change coming to the Tableau platform, definitely. And just to confirm <coughs> that, I can back out to my personal homepage where I'll be able to see inventory <clears throat> fill rate alongside other metrics that I care about. <clears throat> so let's look at this as well. Device sales had an unusual spike. Yep. These are the same three summaries that we saw before. There's always this sort of, was this helpful up or down? It feels like this is sort of like um, you're training the model on what you find useful. And if you do enough of these, eventually over time, they'll just probably stop asking you because they know, right? Google, Google used to do this. It used to ask you what you thought of a, a link. And then it just eventually stopped because they figured out a way of figuring it out without having to ask you. So uh, maybe something we see in the early stages of this kind of technology, but in the future, it will just know. It will just know based on metrics like how much time you spent, how much you engage with it, and then they'll start to sort of train analysts on how to create engaging metrics that actually drive actions and stuff like that. So super interesting. There are three metrics. Who knows what's uh, below the fold? Um, all metrics means probably everything that's shared with you, whereas the ones you're following are the ones you passionately care about. The best part is Pulse isn't just limited to Tableau. It's everywhere you and your teams work today. Like an email where you can receive a daily dose of your metrics. Let's ask April from my team here. Did you get it? Yep. Awesome. <clears throat> there you go. So you get a nice email. And hmm, Tableau Pulse. Oh, interesting. That looks like a Pulse tab inside of the Tableau mobile app. Right, that's what that's got to be. Um, that's all I can assume it is. Uh, you have Home and Explore, which are two tabs you get in Tableau today. Home is like you know, your favorites and everything you follow. Explore is the classic Explore tab. Pulse feels like it's going to be a new tab, which means probably when it comes to cloud, it will also be its own little side tab. It might even be the default place you start to go then to find other things. So it all makes sense. On your phone, where you can receive insights on the go. I am scrolling through them right now. And of course, in Slack, as you saw earlier, we get to collaborate more easily. But here at Dreamforce, we all care about Salesforce, don't we? Mm hmm <laughs> You guessed it. <laughs> I land in Salesforce and find a silence. <laughs> Like the traditional Tableau kind of customer doesn't care about Salesforce. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Let me know. But yes, uh, he was kind of hoping they'd all say Salesforce and uh, didn't quite land that one. But this is Tableau Pulse inside of Salesforce. Now, it's interesting that as soon as it goes to Salesforce, 
it feels different, doesn't it? It looks slightly different and Einstein has popped up already and you've got a slightly different sort of layout. It feels like a more Salesforce centric version of Pulse. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, there's something called omni-channel macros. I love seeing what else is on screen whenever you take like a screen grab like this, because it kind of shows you the context of what people are thinking. Einstein is sitting in the corner there, so you can ask some questions, but it's more or less the same thing. Um, this might be like a new lightning web component that sits specifically inside of Tableau. Uh, there is a new one for, uh, Tableau in 23.3. And so this might be like a pulse extension of that, which is kind of nice. Pulse homepage deeply embedded with all my favorite metrics in one place. And clicking into the metric here, I see the same detailed view with the same mm -hmm. interactions that we've seen. Okay. How so that answers the question. You have to have Tableau Cloud to have that kind of integration. I don't see how you achieve that with a Tableau server behind firewalls. Uh, it just doesn't seem to work. So that might be a nice to only get inside of um, Tableau uh, Cloud. But uh, with Tableau Server, you might be able to use something like connected apps to allow this to happen uh, and get that working. But yeah. That's off. Let's rewind. We trust it. We're familiar with it. It's quick to find and easy to use. Now, all of us can truly succeed from anywhere. And this is Tableau Pulse. Metrics and insights reimagined powered by Tableau AI to enhance and accelerate everyone, to make informed decisions fast, and to take actions on data. Thanks for staying with me, and passing back to you, Francois. All right. <laughs> Great job, okay. Homer. I love Paul. I'm going to pause there. Uh, I'm recording this on a weekend, so I have to keep popping off to do family and personal duties. I'm going to hop away and I'm going to come back and we'll carry on with the rest of this a little later on. But so far, it's super interesting. I'm kind of keen where the rest of this keynote goes. Um, so yeah, I'll see you in a second. Okay, we're back. Let's carry on. I use it now every day and it's really made my daily experience easier. I get all of the information at a glance and I can take action on it really, really quickly. But you know, when you want to explore data, this is really... Again, this is another sort of framing, then you used to build dashboards. Now you ask questions. And again, this is really important. I, I, I cannot, <laughs> like if you build dashboards today, if you're becoming a data analyst today and you think uh, learning how to build dashboards will be the way that Tableau is heading, I think it's changing. I think you need to become more of a data engineer, data modeling expert, metadata expert in order to enable people to do what Tableau is talking about now, how to answer, how to frame, how to contextualize questions. And ultimately, the data is going to be treated. It's going to need to be treated. It's just, it's not just going to work out of the box. When you get, let's say, uh, purchase data from a superstore, it doesn't come ready to do this. When you get um, transaction data from your bank or from an online store, it does not come ready to do this. In order to get it to this place where you can actually use AI on top of it, you're going to need to clean it, prep it, put it into a data model, uh, warehouse it, make it available, uh, think about security, think about all these different things. That is where being a data analyst is going to be heading to, and that's where being a data engineer or being a data modeler will sort of pay dividends. I think the people who build dashboards today are just going to move further back into the stack and do more things to enable these kinds of experiences so everyday people can just go and ask questions. ...where the Tableau superpowers come in. Tableau is easy to use. You can easily slice and dice your data however way you want. But normally when you start in Tableau, you got a blank screen and some data and you have to kind of learn the product. You have to know how to drag and drop where the features are. You need a visionary around you. You need the documentation. You need experts to help you get successful. But what if we brought AI into the experience? What if you had Einstein with you that understood Tableau, could help you answer your questions more easily? Well, the future of Tableau is to have AI embedded in the exploration experience, right. where AI fully understands how to use the product, where AI understands the meaning of your questions and can help essentially do the drag and drop for you. So it's not about Either or, it's an and. It's augmenting the experience, the exactly. experience, making it 10 to 100 times easier and making all of you more productive. 
That is the goal. And so today, I'm pleased to announce the Einstein co-pilot for Tableau. So, uh, Einstein co-pilot, June 24. That's almost a year away, just, uh, just under a year away. Um, this is going to be sensational. I think this is, this is why it has such a long run-up. Uh, so much has to happen. And I think there's some fundamental questions that Tableau have to answer before this kind of tool gets deployed. And yes, you guessed it, it'll probably be cloud first. You won't get this for Tableau Server. <laughs> no way. Tableau Server's probably got a 25 uh, release, if that makes sense. I just, the, the more I think about sort of uh, Salesforce being a SaaS company, the more I think about where Tableau is heading, I just cannot see how some of the uh, ideas they're thinking about here come to Tableau Server in an expedient way. Because like I said before, um, for these things to work on Tableau Server, the requirements on infrastructure are just going to keep going up and up and up until the cost of doing those things kind of pushes you to the cloud, honestly. Um, I've not I've not sort of been in touch with Tableau Server for the last couple of years now because I just haven't needed to use it as much. Tableau Cloud has been the predominant uh, side where clients are working. And so actually knowing how to manage the back end and infrastructure of that um, is almost sort of non-existent because all you have to do is go into online.tableau.com and manage the front end user face there. So um, I'd be really intrigued to know what are the server requirements? What is the server usage of a server today? Um, and what are the features that we get in the cloud that aren't available yet that would sort of increase that? And as Tableau roll out these AI features, how is that going to play out long term? Anyway, interesting, interesting, interesting sort of thing to see play out. Oh, yes. The Einstein Copilot is really going to be a core part of the Tableau experience that enables you to ask questions of your data, and it'll basically explore it for you. It'll give you better results because it understands a lot of the context. You'll have better best practices built in, and ultimately, you'll just be more successful. You'll be able to ask more questions and drive more value to your organization, or you can just put your feet back up and enjoy the rest of your day. So let's see Einstein Copilot in action. So for that, please welcome Hanto May. Hanto. Thanks, Francois. In the next four minutes, I'm going to show you how Einstein Copilot, backed by the Einstein Trust Layer, can speed up and improve the quality of your data analysis. Here in Tableau Prep, I have customer purchase data for a nationwide chain. He's doing this on an iPad. Oh, no, he's on I want to use this data to cool. create personalized experiences for my customers that'll drive incremental revenue. To do so, I need to know where my customers are, so I need their postal codes. Unfortunately, my postal codes are trapped in this customer mailing address column. Right. Normally, I'd have to figure out how to write a calculation to extract this, mm -hmm. but with Einstein, all I need to do is ask in natural language. And on the fly, Einstein is able to create this calculation for us. <laughs> now, all I need to do. Now, I think people have seen this demo before, which is why the crowd didn't uh, have sort of a big reaction. A lot of the people at this conference were at Tableau Conference. And so they've seen this demo, they've seen this example before. That said, it doesn't take away from the, uh, let's say, awesomeness of this, because this is, this is sort of why I believe AI is fundamentally going to change the way analytics is done. You see, previously, uh, if you just looked at this problem, um, let's say you're a data analyst and you don't, you're not, you're not like a uh, an experienced data analyst. You've been working in the field maybe a year or two years, okay? And this is the data set you get. And someone asks you, "Hey, how do you how do you extract the postcodes from uh, this uh, column?" Your first instinct might be to uh, pass out the commas to get the final field of each column which would still leave you with uh, Florida 32244 USA. And then the next thing you might do is to say, okay, if uh, you find any one of these states, uh, go ahead and remove that, which will leave you with 99210 and then USA. But you see, that's not always consistent. You see North Carolina uh, down here is uh, 28405 and doesn't have a country on the end. So sometimes it's USA, sometimes it's US. And you get into this really messy world where if you really have to clean this, you kind of use brute force method and you apply like a really convoluted way of passing this in steps 
maybe 15, 16 steps to get to where you need to, and then you kind of go from there. Well, the experienced analyst will be able to look at this text and say, hmm, there's a path in here. The postcode is essentially um, a certain number of digits followed by letters, essentially, right? And so we can actually go and find that in the string by just looking for that using that pattern. And the technology that helps you do that is called regex. Now you wouldn't know the term regex. You wouldn't even you might stumble across it if you let's go into if so let's say you go into Reddit and you ask a question, you wait a few days, someone replies, or you Google, you come across this thing and it's called regex. Then you go to regex 101 and you start trying to use it and you're like, okay, this is interesting. You go down a rabbit hole, uh, 30 minutes later, you're now figuring out how to write regex for this. And it works, but it doesn't work some of the time. Other times you go to test it. And so you're not so confident. So you try this thing and you kind of move on. That whole flow probably has taken 40 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. If you're super fast, you know what to search and you're kind of adept and you're kind of really going down this route of exploratory sort of data analysis. That said, the simple fact that you can just go in and type the question, and say, I want the postcodes. You don't have to know the term regex. You don't have to know uh, regex pattern matching. You don't even have to go to regex 101 or even ask the question. You can just go and type the ask and the AI tool helps you figure out what you need to know. And here's the added bit. Now that you see that term regex p uh, extract or whatever, that should pique your interest. If you're a good data analyst, that will pique your interest and go, huh, what is this? And so you then go Google that thing and you understand what it is. And now not AI hasn't just solved the problem. It's also giving you a shortcut directly to the thing you need to learn and the way it's working in order to enhance that. So now you kind of start to use AI as a way of discovering things you need to learn as well as a way of helping you, which is sort of a double-edged uh, uh, thing. The next time you come to this, you'll ask specifically, hey, can you use regex to solve this kind of problem? Uh, it's quite complex. And now you're having a much higher level discussion with AI. You're still using AI, but you still understand what's going on and you're building your understanding as you go along. So it's also helping you with data literacy. So I think this is a, this to me is probably the biggest opportunity that Tableau has just to help everyday data analysts who actually still do build uh, data sets and or data models and or visualizations. And more importantly, it's also gonna help bring the skill level up for everyone who's already doing this stuff. It's gonna bring them right up so they too have access and awareness of things like LODs, all these complex terms like set actions, it's not going to solve the problem, but it might just alert you to the capabilities behind these things. Anyway, let's keep seeing the demos and see the examples. Fortunately, my postal codes are trapped in this customer mailing address column. Normally, I'd have to figure out how to write a calculation to extract this, but with Einstein, all I need to do is ask in yeah. natural language. And on the fly, Einstein is able to create this calculation for us. Now, all I need to do is give it a name, and voila, a new column in my data with the customer postal code. This calculation what I would be really interested to know is what's in the reference tab here? I was just thinking about it. I was like, huh, there's a reference tab. Is a reference tab showing you what it's doing? Like, the, the nice thing with websites like Regex 101 is that it shows you how it's working. What I would love Einstein Copilot to do is to almost play through an example of the calculation in the context of Tableau to show you what's happening and even show you what's going on. I've put this here, I've done this there, and almost almost guide you through the steps. Uh, you know, ChatGPT can do this today. It will tell you do this, do this, do that. Obviously, it's not perfect, but if you're training a model specifically around Tableau, that actually it should be possible to be able to instruct it and give you instructions on what exactly is going on. Almost reverse write the blog post that you would write if you'd figured, how, figured out how to do this. Yes. Now, all I need to do is give it a name and voila, a new column in my data with the customer postal code. And I did all of this in a matter of seconds and without writing one line of calculation code. So with Einstein, you and anybody can use Tableau Prep to transform the data they need into the format they want. So how are we gonna reach these customers though? Well, did you know that you can use Tableau to visually explore your audience data and to create audience segments in Data Cloud? Yeah. 
Wrong screen. Nope. <laughs> We're good? Okay, there we are. A little excitement <laughs> there. So I have just connected, with the help of my friends back there, uh, to Data Cloud. Um, now, when I'm presented with a blank slate like this, Interesting. I ask myself, where the heck do I begin? But I the really interesting thing here is that Einstein is already available on the right hand side. And the right hand side has become this sort of contextual place to find out more about the data set, more about what's going on, more about the metadata inside of Tableau. And it's sort of grown legs. This is also where uh, explain data used to be. I kind of feel like that's going to get sort of pushed to the side now. Uh, because you'll have our data, explain data, those are all going to go away and Einstein and uh, Tableau GPT and all Carlson metrics will sort of sit in this space more squarely ready to help you sort of answer questions and pull out insights rather than sort of forcing you to come up with the answer or question uh, yourself. Um, the other nice thing here is obviously this is a web edit experience and this is a draft so that means he's exclusively using the authoring experience in web edit and um, last edited this September the 12th that would have been the time of the demo. So he's using a sort of live take of this, um, if that makes sense. All these details do matter because I think um, a lot of people think about Tableau in the desktop sort of setup when in reality, that's not how most of it works. That's not how most of Tableau demos anything anymore. It's all done in the browser. And so um, it's interesting to see that. I don't think you'll get the same experience in desktop. I just don't think that will pull through unless you're a Tableau cloud customer. I kind of think this is going to be a really a smoother experience in the web because that's essentially where this will be running. Otherwise, you can just imagine sort of the back and forth uh, between your local client and your laptop and Tableau servers when this stuff is running. Um, but it will still be interesting to see. Now, the customer purchase history, what is not clear is if this is a data set in Salesforce, and that is why Einstein Copilot and uh, this technology is working really well, or if this is going to work across non-Salesforce based data sources as well. So things like in your Snowflake, in your Databricks database, whatever those are, um, that detail is still not clear. I assume it will work everywhere and Tableau will be running this technology on the cloud, looking at these data sets and sort of processing them. That's how some of the uh, past features have worked. There's something called Data Change Radar, which has essentially been taking snapshots on your server and then analyzing that on your cloud instance and then pushing you alerts when something changes that shouldn't have changed. So Super interesting uh, little little nugget. Let's see how it actually works. So I've just Einstein has got you covered. Using generative <laughs> AI and statistical analysis, Einstein's able to understand the context of your data. And in doing so, Einstein is able to suggest relevant business questions to kickstart your analysis. Oh, that's really Let's good. Let's take a look at this I'll one about patterns um, of my sales over different product categories. And look, with one click and without having to drag a single pill onto a shelf, I'm able to see the viz that shows my sales for all my different product categories. But what okay. about this pattern Einstein was looking at? I can see, yeah, that's right. Outdoor sporting goods are popular in the summertime. That's not a surprise, but that gives me an idea. I know that our in-store experiences drive bigger purchases compared to online. What if we invite these outdoorsy and sporty people back into a store with an event like a outdoor pet first aid class? Well, how am I going to do that? First of all, we're going to use those postal codes we extracted earlier. And you guessed it, we're going to ask Einstein. Yeah. Show me the location of customers who bought sporting goods in the last three months by zip code. All right, I see all my customers on a map. That's all right, but good. what about my stores? How far are these customers from store locations? And look, oh, there we go. without knowing Smooth. anything about map layers. So I'd seen this before, but I was paying attention to what was going on and what changed. And the great thing about this, <sighs> So, see, customer transactions, store locations. Store locations is in which, there we go. So there's two data sets in this data model. 
Uh, one is customer transactions, one is store locations. And essentially what they're doing is relating the customer transaction to the store level data, which gives us two spatial fields. Um, the uh, city or, yeah, there's a customer location field. So it could be the city or the whatever um, of the customer, their address. And then you have um, the location from the store. And so to bring these two together, you are creating map layers. Uh, you're putting the two on top of each other. Because they're in the same data set, they have a data model relationship. So they should it should naturally work um, nicely. You can do that without a relationship. You can just bring on your store locations as a separate data source. And a new feature, ooh, nearly a year ago now, allowed you to basically overlay two separate data sets on a map without having to do any sort of join or relation to them, which is kind of powerful actually, because it allows you to bring contextual sort of map layers without having to like do the dirty work of uh, blending it or doing whatever you needed to do to make the map work. So this is quite nice. Now, why I like this demo is because it kind of shows that iteration. It kind of shows uh, Tableau kind of going through the steps. And again, I believe the language that's being used here is generally authentic. It's kind of what you'd ask in terms of the analysis. If you're asking good, good questions, that is a skill in itself. But I think this is a fair reflection of what people would actually do with AI. And it's doing what you'd expect it to do. Now, what we can't tell by this demo is how often is it good at doing this? Because you know, sometimes with AI, these things just, you know, 90% of the time they're okay. Uh, and sorry, 90% of they're good. 10% of the time they're okay. And when they fail, they fail epically, right? So this looks pretty good. It's doing a few complex things, latitude, longitude, bring it all in. There's levels of detail here that are on there on both the customer and the store locations and the marks pane. There is coloring uh, going on. Um, you could argue potentially there's some buffering going on. I don't know if the size of the circle, yeah, the size of the circle represents the customer count from that store. So I actually think it's sort of interesting because the customer, you know, the customer count maybe relates to like, um, maybe it's a specific town uh, for these customers and it's just showing you where uh, those people are coming from in those towns. And that's why certain towns have bigger or smaller circles. Um, but you have customer city, customer, I don't know, something. Uh, I can't see the location hierarchy. So <laughs> again, unnecessary levels of details, unnecessary level of uh, breakdown of the details here, but it seems pretty good. And you know, the demo adds up. That's all That's all I'm trying to make sure. Like, is this a far-fetched demo? No, it's not. And it's probably something you'd get asked to do and you'd be asked to put this in a dashboard. Now, the super interesting thing here is just imagine that the whole of the left-hand side doesn't exist and all you have is the Einstein column on the right and the customer location chart, and that's all you get. What if that's the experience of Tableau going forward, right? For every person, for everyone, that becomes the experience. But they're trying it here first with data analysts to kind of test if it's good and if it's bad. But slowly over time, this experience where you type and you see charts will be pretty much the core experience of Tableau. What do you think? <laughs> Let's carry on. Or geographic roles in Tableau, I was able to create this intuitive yet complex map viz with Einstein. But don't forget, Tableau at its heart is an interactive and visual tool. I can easily grab these customers from San Francisco and with our integration with Salesforce, send these customers up okay. as a audience segment. Now that is a, <laughs> that's a pretty sick feature if you say a Salesforce customer. Just being able to select the, do the analysis, select the uh, customers, uh, create a segment and push it back into uh, Salesforce. I mean, that is, if you're a Salesforce customer and a Tableau customer, that is chef's kiss. That is, that is perfect, right? Like that is the dream. Now in reality, <laughs> not many people have the ability to do that or sort of trusted to do that. But in reality, like if that was your flow and you could enable that, and don't forget, this has not been published. This is still exploratory analysis. And it's like a, it's an easy thing to forget. We're not going from dashboard to Salesforce here. We're going from uh, sort of detailed discovery. So an analyst has been asked to go and find this customer segment and push it to um, where they need to get to. Um, as soon as that question comes back, boom, they can just go back into the chart they built without publishing anything and push it off into, into Salesforce. So I think that's also really nice. Um, celebration of Tableau's heritage. It was always a data exploration tool and 
kind of easy to miss in this demo, right? Because you're so caught up in the feature. But actually, the fact they didn't publish it before doing this, I think that's super powerful. It's super important. Going straight to the action rather than this whole, like, you know, governance and publishing thing. Like, if you're empowered to do this, just go ahead, push it to the Salesforce instance and move on to the next task. Perfect. And I did all of this without leaving Tableau. Now, oop, I can't get to the screen. Oh, sorry, my bad. And now my uh, my marketing team has all <laughs> the information the they need. April deserves to, a hero's cake. Uh, activate the segment and <laughs> in a demo send when, that, when something goes wrong, and like, you know what's gone wrong, but the person who's experiencing it go wrong. Uh, at the moment, it doesn't do what they're expecting. It doesn't matter if they're on point. It doesn't matter if they're about to nail the demo. Nothing matters. As soon as something goes wrong, your brain just goes into like like freeze mode because you're like, <laughs> what's going on here? You can't really think fast enough to kind of rescue yourself. So for April to sort of notice that and catch that moment and get Hunter back onto on, on track, it's like that is that is uh, that is superhero stuff. Uh, I'd like to say not all uh, heroes have capes, but uh, April definitely deserves one there because <laughs> it's a small thing and I'm sure Honto super appreciated it at the time. But it's so easy, it's so easy in that instance to just freeze for like two, three minutes, fix it, and off you go. This. There we Gosh, go. Demo gods are like really this, slight. And to all my customers. You know what? Like, and yes. <laughs> the thing that's really unfair here is just that Honto is not controlling the transitions between uh, the slides. So from phone to laptop, Honto is not controlling that. So on top of like things going wrong, uh, like whoever's controlling the PowerPoint is just not working quickly enough. So um, it's not. It's one of those sort of compounding effects. It's kind of funny, but yeah. Anyway, it looks uh, pretty, pretty good. I did manage, and maybe this is why we didn't have a good demo, I managed to sneak my dog into the keynote presentation. <laughs> All right. Now, in summary, Einstein Copilot, backed by the Einstein Trust Layer, will let anybody who can ask a question visually explore their data in Tableau. And with our deep integrations into Data Cloud, you can get the insights you need to connect with your customers faster. And back to you, Francois. Cool. Awesome, great job, Honto. I gotta say, any demo that includes a dog photo is a fantastic demo. That's the simple <laughs> demo rules. You know, with the Einstein Copilot, you basically have an expert with you at all times to help you get to the answers faster. It is powerful. But we want to go further. We want to infuse data and AI everywhere. You know, today when you think about your business applications, well, they're your business applications. If you want to get answers from those, you go somewhere else. And you have that typical swivel chair problem. You lose context. You lose the data. It's just frustrating for the users. Well, who wants a dumb CRM or a dumb application? You want smarts built in. You want insights right where you do your work. And this is what we're trying to do with our brand new intelligent applications for Salesforce. These are pre-built applications available out of the box that you can use to deliver insights right in the flow of work. So, so these are, God, I wanna say these are templates, but I think they're specifically Salesforce templates, right? So they're like, and um, the Tableau Exchange uh, dashboard starters or whatever they call them. Um, they're not called uh, uh, accelerators, they're called in the Tableau world. I think they're the Salesforce equivalent of Tableau accelerators, if that makes sense. Purpose-built apps that hook into various parts of your CRM, ready to go with all the insight built in, uh, but with a little bit of Tableau, I think, and a little bit of um, uh, Salesforce as well infused. So let's have a look. Whether you're using Service Cloud or Revenue Cloud, you have insights automatically there for you. It's easier to get going. You just deploy them and boom, you've got value automatically. So this is coming out November 23. This might be the first time we see AI and Einstein available in some sort of tablet context. So that's uh, super cool. But of course, it's in the CRM. It's contextual to the job you have at hand. 
The insights, the dashboards, the KPIs are built for the task that you have. And of course, it leverages the complete power of the platform, from CRM analytics to Tableau to Data Cloud. This is the full power of Salesforce coming together in these rich applications. So to sh show our next applications, please welcome Shrivi oh, Agandeshwan to the stage. Shrivi. Thank you, Francois. Hello, Dreamforce. As engineering leader for intelligent applications, I'm super thrilled to be showing you today what my team has built. Tailored experiences helps everyone achieve their work faster by streamlining data. With service intelligence, you get key insights to effectively run your service operations. Out-of-the-box pre-built dashboards enable you three key insights for service leaders. Comprehensive case views, omni-channel, and conversation mining. So let's jump in. With omni-channel view, routing cases is easier than ever. Leaders can track their volumes of work by cases and channels to reduce costs and improve service operations. Behind the scenes, all of these data sources from various channels, conversation data, mm -hmm. omni-channel data, service data, and third party are all harmonized and powered by data cloud. Right. Some of the most valuable data we have about service operations is the millions of hours agents spent on call every day with our customers. What if right. we use AI to unlock the data? So I might have been wrong about these being Tableau charts. A part of me thinks they're actually native within Salesforce. The way that page loaded made it look more like a web element than it was anything else. Um, but I think this is one of those um, sort of uh, effects from, uh, what do you call it? Um, it used to be called Einstein Analytics. It might have been a leftover from Einstein Analytics. It sits within the Tableau world, the Tableau framing of analytics, but is being deployed inside of Salesforce. So I, I don't quite understand what this is. It could also just be Tableau with really good animations and uh, some caching in the background just to make it load nice and fast. But I'm not 100% sure. You could definitely build something that looks like this in Tableau. Um, I just can't quite place what this little box is inside of Salesforce. But anyway, let's keep going. We might get a clue. Service intelligence now brings in Einstein conversation mining, which mines all the customer interactions. Integrated, identify the top reasons and key drivers and highlights it in a trusted and secured way. As you can see here, Customers are having a lot of questions about their invoice. I think that is Tableau. Wait, With these wait, 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 wait. there's service... a clue, there's a clue, there's a clue. She, she hovered over it. A lot of questions about their invoice. Right, this is not Tableau. Yeah. With these insights, service leaders can identify and focus on the areas that they may not otherwise be aware of. With cases dashboard, Leaders get a comprehensive view of their team's work on high-level stats, good. such as total escalated cases, CSAT by channel. As you can see here... There's a little bit of a spacing issue there. They're, they're kind of being cut off. Um, I think it might be because they're on a laptop and it's compressing everything and the charts don't quite fit the container uh, that's been sort of put around the object. So a little bit of haste about uh, uh, tweaking that needs to go on there. Uh, but otherwise, um, I think these actually look quite nice. They're quite practical from a business perspective because I think they just answer the question and just get on with it. There's sort of no flair and they're fast and they're efficient. So you know what? They're going to do the work. So um, as someone who sort of doesn't know what tool this is, I think this is Einstein, then I think there's also this other side of Salesforce, which is, um, you know, the Salesforce platform itself has this huge plethora of data if you go and build pre-built dashboards that you know answer typical questions that most customers answer, um, why build it in Tableau when you can build native web experiences that run even faster than Tableau? And that sort of speaks to part of the challenge of innovation. When you're doing data exploration, you need a lot more sort of oomph to be able to let the user choose where the questions and answers go. 
But if you already know uh, and you're going to prescribe the questions and you're going to want to answer them in a specific way because that's the best way to answer it, then you can just go ahead and build a native web experience. In the monthly trend, our incoming cases have been spiking up. Normally, we would need to spend time analyzing this. But now, with one click, I can ask Einstein. Service intelligence brings me the power of generative AI, mm -hmm. guiding me through intelligent prompts to understand the key factors that are driving my case escalation. As you can see here, it indicates yeah. that cases re reason being billing as a topmost reason for the escalation. So let me explore this data more deeply. Okay. Right from here, I can explore into Tableau. Okay, so we switch into Tableau. Fine. There's a Tableau. Service intelligence the brings the power of Salesforce data cloud and Tableau visual exploration analytics right for you. Now, being me, I have spotted something. There is a new icon for that data set on the top left. So that suggests like a new uh, data object. Um, the other thing is when she clicks on it, she went straight into a pre-built dashboard in Tableau. So it's not just like taking the data into Tableau and then sort of leaving you to build this yourself. It's actually going ahead and recreating that chart you saw, but in Tableau, which is sort of interesting. Like, why isn't that just uh, the application view of that thing? And again, it speaks to this idea that maybe that is it. They're building a native web sort of chart interface on the front. But then when you click, you go to the editable version, which is designed for data exploration inside a Tableau. That looks uh, pretty cool. As you can see here, I have maintained the data context and connected to the same insights without any additional effort. Now let me drill into the data more deeply. I can pull up a quick sheet in Tableau. And did you see that? I don't yeah. have to connect to the data again. I have it right here from Service Intelligence. Just open the new sheet. Yeah. So within a few clicks, I want to understand how my cases are geographically distributed across in the US. As you, get a As you can see here, nice. Oregon and Marin are having the higher spots. And let me get this insight back to my team. Right from Tableau, I can publish to Salesforce within a few clicks. All of done. my inter insights are natively available for me. I can drill into the same filter context in the service workflow. There you have it. Service intelligence breaks the data silos, brings analytics to every Salesforce users in their flow of work, supercharging data with AI in the world's best CRM. Back to you, Francois. That, that demo is really good. Like it, it's a really good contextual sort of uh, use case for how you could use it. And actually, of all the things in this keynote, it's probably the most like realistic and the one that feels sort of tangible. Everything you saw there, like, is using technology we know today, apart from the Einstein sort of question that came up, everything else was just, you know, standard Salesforce, standard tablet, but really well integrated with each other. Um, I think the reason the crowd wasn't so sort of blown away by some of this is either because they've seen it before, that sometimes happens, but also um, this isn't a Salesforce sort of crowd. Yes, there's lots of people here um, who are from Salesforce and the Dreamforce conference, but at the same time, a lot of the people in this room are probably Tableau sort of, you know, they've come to see Tableau features, not necessarily Salesforce features. So sometimes when you get such a quiet response to something as the demos are happening, uh, it could either be that the sound design is not capturing the sound or that actually, you know, yeah, the features are impressive, but, you know, the people there are more akin to seeing the same thing in Tableau and that's what they're really there for. Great job, Srivi. So this is how we're bringing analytics to everyone, to every single user, to every single company, to every single application. Because really the opportunity is to have analytics without limits, analytics without constraints. 
where AI is built in and provides a new superpower and supercharges every experience, every user, and makes everyone successful. And talking about being successful, it's time to talk about our customers and how our right. customers are able to use data to do more. And so for that, I'd like to welcome Emacs. Come on up, Elizabeth. Thank you, Francois. Hello, everybody, and thank you for being here today. Now, as we've mentioned, data is for everybody. You might even say that data is a team sport. And speaking of sports, I am a huge baseball fanatic. I played softball my entire life, as you see by my adorable cute photo here. And when growing up in Michigan is a way to stay connected back to my family when we moved to California, I participated in three fantasy baseball leagues with my cousins, my high school buddies, and my college friends. Now imagine all of that data that was available to me back then through tools and online. I wish that I had Tableau to help me. And that's why I am so excited to share this inspiring story of the Texas Rangers. They are an organization that has truly transformed their company with data both on and off the field. Let's go ahead and take a look. Cool. My favorite thing. So, uh, in the past, I've gotten in trouble of uh, playing these uh, <laughs> in my videos. So I encourage you to go to the Salesforce Plus website and watch these uh, yourself. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead. Um, actually to the customers just finishing talking because um, essentially uh, when customers agree to talk to Tableau, they don't specifically agree for people like me to critique them on the YouTube channel. I've done that in the past and uh, yeah, I just decided not to do that this time around. So we're going to skip ahead. And uh, I think it's actually a really cool story about how um, yeah, they've used data to sort of get through a tough patch. And then we get the customer coming on stage uh, to talk a little bit about it. So I'm going to keep going until just after the uh, customer finishes. Um, I think the customer gives Emacs a hoodie, a team shirt, a team player shirt. Uh, we'll see this moment very soon. It's actually a pretty good conversation, so um, it's pretty awesome. But uh, then Larissa comes on. I think they get like a, a T-shirt here or something. So I'll actually play from here on because I know the conversation's done, and we'll go from there. Excited. It's not the team team. <laughs> it's actually the business analytics team. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love the sign ball from the analytics team. This is pretty nice. Thank nice you stuff. so much. Nice yeah. Michelle and I have become uh, fast friends in the last month. So, uh, so now I'm glad I am a Rangers fan. Now Tableau also has fans, and that is our data fam. So to introduce you to them, I'd love to bring up to the stage VP of Community, Larissa Amoroso. Nice. I'm jealous. Uh, the Tableau community, also known as the Data Fam, is a global network of more than 3 million people who push the boundaries of our products, champion data culture, and help people everywhere see and understand their data. But rather than just talk about the incredible data fam, I thought I would try something a little different and show you. Here at Tableau, we're always experimenting with new and exciting ways to explore so, our data. Yeah. Like with Tableau Gestures, which allows you to present any data on any computer with any webcam. Let's say you want to join the Tableau community. <laughs> So if, you, if you've not seen this before, um, uh, this demo is called uh, Augmented Chironomy or something like that. Um, anyway, it's augmented reality sort of take on Tableau with a slightly different interface, well, completely different interface that's controlled with just gestures, essentially. And um, it's actually been in several demos. It's one Bake Off. It's been a pretty interesting feature that Tableau have been showcasing a lot in the last year as a showcase of innovation, basically, where Tableau is thinking. It's not going to be available. There's no release date. If it was going to be released, it will probably be next year or a year after that. There's a lot of things to sort of work out with this. And it's definitely more of a presentation tool, and I really, really like it. I, I like it as a concept. I'd love to know what Tableau think of this. Now you've got technology like the Apple Vision Pro available. Not that you're going to be doing this in Apple Vision Pro, sat there with a the headset on your face. But I do think it's kind of an interesting thing that Tableau have this uh, innovation here with gestures and then Apple's coming out with technology which supports gestures. 
it feels like there's something there that's sort of interesting to explore. Anyway, um, it's a really cool demo. I've done a video on it. So go ahead and check it out. I'll put it up on screen. Uh, go ahead and find that. Um, Larissa does a very short take on it here, which is interesting. So let's take a look. The biggest community is here in the United States, but what about the rest of the world? We can clearly see the top 25 countries listed at the bottom ranked by number of community leaders. <laughs> Tableau visionaries, ambassadors, and user group leaders around the world are hosting local meetups, leading visualization challenges, and answering tough data questions to help you no matter where you are on your analytics journey. That's right. We have community leaders all over the world ready to welcome you. Now, I could play with that all day, but I am <laughs> so excited because today we have a very special guest tuning oh, in gosh. live from his home in the UK, <laughs> Tableau visionary, Tim Nuena. Oh, God. Also Here we known go. as Tableau Tim. Moment. He is... <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> Hi there, fam. You almost need no introduction. Um, <laughs> I wanted to stop it here because this is the inception moment where I'm in the keynote whilst we're doing a reaction video. I still laugh at this because it's absolutely crazy, honestly. Um, so at this point, I'm not going to kind of continue watching myself um, uh, uh, in this in this keynote. Um, the context here is that initially, it's it's sort of funny. I should have known what was coming, but initially, I, I actually didn't sort of put two or two together until. Um, the event, but I'd started talking to Tableau, I think two, two, three months ago, actually about doing something at Dreamforce. And I just thought, hey, you know, as they have done with customers, um, they wanted me to talk about AI and how it could help data analysts, specifically around skills and education. And actually, this is what we sort of go on talking about. And I'll talk a bit more about my response to the questions I get asked here. But anyway, it kind of ended with a surprise. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been a pretty incredible response, frankly, from the community. I absolutely uh, like, you know, hugely grateful and genuinely shocked at the time. And I, you know, I, I think afterwards, it's sort of weird. Like the life of a creator is completely weird because, um, you know, <laughs> I, I sat in my room here in a virtual event. Um, I'm actually in the keynote. We're live. Nothing was pre-recorded. Uh, there was incredible amounts of lag. And so a bit of inside baseball. As soon as I responded the first time to Larissa, I immediately knew how much lag there was <laughs> because I could hear the feedback uh, from the, um, uh, what do you call it, from the audience, from the room through her microphone. So as soon as I said the first thing and then it came back to me two seconds, I was like, oh, crap, I need to listen to what Larissa is saying. And as soon as I think she's about to finish, start talking immediately. So the lag is like halved almost. And that's essentially what I did for the whole thing. So every time I responded, I was actually trying to do that just to cut the lag. But these are the kind of things that go through my head um, here. Like rather than <laughs> worrying or stressing about like, what I'm going to say, um, that's sort of what was going through my mind. I was kind of stressing a whole ton. I actually start sweating in this video. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> I'm calling it out now because I can and it's afterwards. But nonetheless, um, yeah, I really enjoyed this sort of whole interview. But anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait and maybe give a little bit more color to each of my responses in this because I think um, in this section, I had to sort of give short, sharp uh, responses. I did know what question she was going to ask me. I didn't know what was coming at the end, but... Um, I wanted to give more context here because I think it's important and it's actually, you know, I've sat here and critiqued the whole entire keynote. I guess I have to critique myself. So <laughs> let's let's take this let's take this a little bit further. I might skip a also few Also known as Tableau Tim, cringy. he is uh, an analytics <laughs> okay, consultant. It's immediately cringy. Let's skip ahead a and little a bit here. With more than 55,000 subscribers <laughs> and more than 2.8 million views. Let's double Android. through this, yeah. So with all of his efforts, he is helping people everywhere grow their data skills. Okay, let's so carry on Thank you here. so much for joining us today. I Absolutely, would... a pleasure. So um, there you go. That's when I noticed lag. You have lag. so many okay. accomplishments. How did you get from your very first viz to where you are now in your career? So it started out in um, student analytics. I was looking at student data at the University of York where I studied, and <laughs> um, I ended up uh, going to another opportunity to work in marketing and communications, and the data there just sort of pulled me in. Um, the problem I had, though, is that the stories that were coming from that data weren't as compelling. Um, a lot of the social media data 
So uh, another thing I'm actually quite impressed by, so we're using Zoom here. Like I'm patched into conference by Zoom and Zoom held up. Like it was solid. The sound was good. The video quality was coming through totally fine. I think Zoom compresses the video down to 720p. I had like a proper camera going, which could have pushed a 4K stream to this. But I think 1080p would have been fine anyway. Um, the kind of thing I'm interested in after this is this actually works pretty well. And I think it's a good example of, hey, if you can't get someone to the keynote, if they've got the setup, you can do a virtual setup. And that was always sort of my pitch to Tablet. Hey, I can't be there in person, but I think I've got a good enough setup to do this this way. And I think it worked out. Um, but anyway, um, really, really cool. Now, the context of this answer is about uh, how I actually started out in analytics. In essence, I used Tableau for the first time without realizing it. I was understanding uh, data about postgraduate students because I worked briefly as a, a student union president, essentially student politics here in the UK. And um, the super interesting there was that the university I went to, University of York, was one of the early adopters of Tableau. They were using Tableau to visualize student metrics and they were sharing it on their website through like an embedded sort of uh, setup. So you could have this little um, Tableau dashboard that people could explore and you could actually download your data from it and do various things. This is very early days of Tableau. And so I actually did that. I downloaded the data off a chart and then re-pivoted it and did some stuff in Excel to then go and try and visualize and understand what was going on with postgraduate students. Anyway, I didn't know it at the time, but that was Tableau. That was basically what I was using. And it's only a few years later where I, I, I then came across Tableau again, like two, three years later, I came across Tableau, this time as like a professional. And I realized, hey, I've used this before. I used it when I was looking at student politics, but now I'm using the uh, authoring experience. And so that's actually sort of how it started. And I got to that experience through uh, someone I met at university at the information lab, so Craig Bloodworth. And um, he encouraged me to say, hey, come come join this small company. It's called the information lab. Um, you'll learn a lot more about data than working in marketing and communication. So that's what I did. I joined uh, back then when it was a company of 11 people. And then fast forward a decade later, um, information Lab's grown. I've since moved on from the Information Lab. I've worked at Accenture. I now work at Endpoint Digital. And it's super interesting um, to, just to see that journey. And um, I think I'd go on to explain more about that. But in essence, um, it started off with sort of my passion for quantified self, which is what really sort of made things connect in my mind. It made me really understand that I was getting passionate about data, my own data in a specific way. And actually businesses had the same passion with their own data. People in businesses really understood their businesses as well as I understood my music data, as well as I understood my running data. And so um, in talking to people and talking to people about their data, I started to see some challenges, things that weren't quite clicking, uh, concepts that weren't working in Tableau. And so what I did way back when, if you go to the oldest videos on this channel, you'll see the first ones about layout containers. You'll see some others about Tableau 10 and design. I just thought, hey, let me make some videos just highlighting these things so that I can point people to them and see what they, they, they're they like. I started and I stopped and I gave up, basically. I did it for like three months and then I gave up. I just did the classic sort of uh, defeated setup. And what was what was super interesting about that is that having done that, we then, uh, you know, I, I just sort of carried on for another two years, went to Accenture. And at Accenture, I came across this problem again, but this time it was with, it was with younger data analysts, so people who um, were just starting out as associates at, at Accenture and they were just starting their career and they're asking me, hey, how do I use Tableau? How do I do this? How do I do this? And it was really easy to explain to them what was going on, but I, I just ended up most of the time just getting on a call and just showing them. And so I thought, huh, what if I just record videos instead and then send them the link? That would be much faster. So that's what I started doing. And then I gave up again. <laughs> and then... Right before COVID, um, there was an opportunity that came up to go to New York for a reason I won't go into. And um, it, it didn't play through because uh, something happened in my life that changed sort of the outcome of that. So instead of going to New York, I ended up staying here in the UK. And uh, after that, I was like really bummed out that I wasn't going to New York. So I thought, oh, you know what? God damn it. Like, honestly, seriously, what can I do? Is there a way I can do what I was going to do in New York without, um, you know, you know, without sort of changing something? Could I approach this concept in, in a bigger way? Could I make a bigger impact um, doing something else? And I looked back at my videos and I thought, you know what, actually I can. I can go back to that concept of videos and start making more. So I pledged to make three videos. I pledged to make a video explaining what Tableau is. And I pledged to start making videos about what's new in Tableau. So the new in Tableau videos are what came first. 
four months later, you saw the what is Tableau video that was basically planned like before that video was released, well before. And um, yeah, here we are. Um, what, 55,000 subs later and, you know, many more thousands watching every single week, every month. Um, we're hitting milestones um, and now supporting lots of people on LinkedIn, essentially taking the same concept, just scaling it up and explaining to people what Tableau is and helping people uh, understand how to use it and how to work with data fundamentally. And so that's what this conversation was actually sort of crunched down from. That was sort of the full context, but it was synthesized just to fit in this sort of three minute segment in the QDAC. So I, I thought that was useful context nonetheless. And that's sort of what we spoke about. And um, I'm not sure I'm now willing to listen to myself go through any of that in in, in, in like a third of the time, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, that's what it is. So let's uh, let's quickly, I might double speed through this and just go right past the uh, the end. So let's watch this quickly. To the time, just measured likes and, and, and these sort of basic metrics. And so I ended up um, finding a route into analytics. And uh, when I started to yeah. work with data, I started to realize the businesses were super passionate about their data. But the moment it clicked was when I started looking at quantified self data. That's uh, the kind of data Ryan was talking about, data from Strava, uh, Last FM, and so on and so forth. And it's only then I realized that the passion I had for my own data was the passion that businesses had for their data. And so um, I started to spot some common themes weird. that people were struggling with as they were working with their data. And I thought I'd start to make a visual way of sort of helping them uh, understand those problems and, and get past them. So that's that's how it started. And then here we are today. Such a story journey. Now, um, many people here are... I think Larissa also understood the lag was was quite big because she, she cut in faster than I think it would have taken for that. So I think we were both doing this thing where we were kind of... She, she, she knew what I was going to say, generally speaking. So she knew when I was coming to the end of my point. So she could just actually cut in and I could do the same as well because I kind of knew the general question she was going to ask me. So that... <laughs> We kind of did some great teamwork here to kind of make it work with, with less lag than the Atlantic Ocean actually allowed for. So that was pretty funny. Are still, you know, just getting started on their analytics journey. Um, and it's a little bit of a different landscape today. What has you most excited as you think about Tableau and this new AI revolution? I think AI has uh, this incredible opportunity to uh, amplify uh, people who are already is exceptionally skilled, uh, sort of raise their skills up to the ceiling. But also for people who are struggling to get into these topics or struggling to pick up these skills, it actually has a, an ability to lower the barriers, almost uh, help them get into these topics. Uh, and so it, it can simplify the entry points uh, for a particular topic. We saw Hunter do a nice demo there. But also I think it's got this ability to help people with their skills. It kind of brings them into a topic so they can okay. understand <laughs> what to Google. What to so what's going through my mind right now is like, this is just stressful. Like. <laughs> I make videos all the time and it's no different to the videos except for this is live, right? And I'm not going to a script either. I'm not reading like a teleprompter. I could have, I could, I actually thought after the event, why didn't I just set this up as a teleprompter? And I wouldn't have been stressing myself out trying to make sure I thread the point I was trying to make in less sort of compressed time rather than just waffle on like I do here and like I do in most videos actually. And so you can see on my face, I'm literally stressing. If you see like sort of the, <laughs> the, the, the sort of silver linings, it's so bad. It's it's honestly embarrassing. But um, the room wasn't even that hot. It's just one of these things where you're panicking because, you know, that's just like how the human body works, right? And I just suddenly just got really, really hot. And then, yeah, <laughs> I just got, started panicking, I guess. So started that's sweating my head off. Oh, my build word. on those skills. Now, with your platform, you're bringing data skills to so many people. How, um, what is something that you can share with us about teaching and giving back? <laughs> it's, um, it's a super interesting... That meme of the guy sweating profusely comes to my face at the moment. <laughs> Interesting cycle. I think one of the things that um, I always tell people is that when I make videos, I learn a lot more about the topic than I would have done if I just went to learn about the topic. So teaching kind of makes you understand the topic to another level. Yeah. And when you put that content out there into the community, you get sort of responses. People ask you more questions. And actually, those questions are the best questions to answer because they enhance your understanding. So it's this sort of nice feedback loop that just sort of happens and um, what is nice about that is that, you know, I got my sort of breaking data through the data firm and it's just been really special to sort of give it back as well. So hopefully that cycle continues and we keep building the data firm. Well, speaking of giving back, you have done 
at this point, I am just absolutely, <laughs> the sweat is fully formed. I think if we'd gone on for another two minutes, you would have seen one drip down my head, honestly. I don't know why I'm tearing myself apart here, but it's just so funny. I don't know. If you've ever been on stage in front of people and had this feeling, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But anyway, here we go. So much for Tableau and for the data fam. Before I let you go, I have one more thing I'd like to share. It's a golden hoodie, oh, wow. and we have one in the mail <laughs> on its way to you now. Uh, Tim, Amazing. You, um, you truly embody what it means to be a Tableau community leader and a visionary. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. Congratulations again, and thank you so much for joining us today. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Wow, what a magical moment. I wish he would have been here, but this was fun too. Um, back in 2022, we <laughs> made a pledge to all of you to bring more foundational skills to everyone. I am so proud to say that we are on our way to enabling uh, 10 million people by 2027. We hope you'll join us on this journey. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Ryan. Thank you, great job. So I want, to, um, I want to say thank you. I know we've gone a little bit over, but I also want to remind you, we are your guide here at Tableau and Salesforce on your data journey. There's a lot to learn out there, and I want to make sure that you also know. Uh, clearly, when we talk about data for everyone, we've covered the business user, we've covered the analyst and the Salesforce CRM user. Honestly, I'm, please, I'm actually sort of blown uh, away check still us out. that. Like, We're I'm out just, here. Please stand uh, out. We've got Tableau I'm doing conference video also here. coming up in um, San Diego. But yeah. Um, it's pretty much the end of this, the, the, the conference. Um, um, I'm going to try and dig into some of the uh, content from conference itself once I can sort of find out how to get access to what was recorded and what wasn't. Um, I think there's lots of useful context. And once uh, conference is normally over, you tend to get more blogs and posts about it as well, released on the Tableau blog. So as soon as that happens, I'm going to try and get access to some of that. And uh, to give you some context, behind the scenes, uh, I've actually started to get some support and help uh, to help make more content more quickly. One of the biggest bottlenecks in just all the videos I make is actually me uh, being able to record, edit, rate, a script, uh, animate, draw. Like it's all been a one person team all, all the way now. Everything you see uh, literally goes through this desk and what well, that means is some of the things I do aren't as best as they can be because if you're split a hundred different ways while well, you're not doing any one thing exceptionally well. So part of the effort is going into getting some of the other stuff. So the editing, the uh, planning of content, making sure that it's all formed correctly, the checking of mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. Thankfully, you all on it with comments and I get emails from Tableau. I get emails from customers as well telling me where I'm going wrong. I'd love to support more of those, um, spot more of those up front. So I'm uh, definitely in the process of uh, getting help. I've actually already started to get some help. I'll talk more about that in the future uh, once it's uh, appropriate to do so. But um, that will help me stay on top of how fast this platform is moving. I fully intend to do that. Um, one of the biggest sort of regrets I have at the moment is not knowing more about Salesforce so I can cover these sort of overlaps between Tableau and Salesforce and be a conduit for people to sort of um, get into that. So. Definitely something I'll do, uh, be a little bit slow initially, but we'll eventually pick up pace and we'll find a way of making it work. Um, San Diego is the next conference uh, for Tableau, so April the 29th. It is just the Tableau conference in, in California, so that's going to be a really, really nice touch. Uh, 29th to the May the 1st, 2024, I think that makes it three days, um, which is super interesting. I think it's a Monday to Wednesday. Um, and yeah, uh, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of other experiences here uh, on, the, uh, on the slide uh, related to Salesforce. So um, that's pretty cool. But yeah, look, that's pretty much the end of this. Um, we'll cut it there, short there, and uh, I'll take an, uh, an ending there. Um, if you're wondering, um, when am I going to uh, wear this hoodie? Well, the hoodie, <laughs> the hoodie has a, a separate story. If you want to know the full story behind the hoodie, um, watch my next video probably after this one, which will hopefully be uh, with the hoodie and involve the hoodie. So let's wait and see. But um, I'll definitely do a separate video on that uh, for reasons you'll find out for in the next video. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.